Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Your Library at Home. My name is Sam Hagen and I'm part of the library's public programming team. I'd like to begin today by acknowledging that we meet on country. I live and work on Gadigal land and I take this opportunity to pay my respects to elders past, present and especially emerging. And I also extend that respect to any Aboriginal Australians who may be joining us today. Welcome everyone. And to this latest in this series of the library's online curator talks. Uh, we're really pleased to be presenting these to you during these times and we've got such interesting curatorial work going on even during COVID times. So we love sharing that with you. Today we're going to hear from Sarah Morley. Sarah is a curator in the research and discovery branch at the library. And she works with the library's collections across the board, particularly manuscripts, rare books and children's literature collections. She's curated numerous exhibitions and displays for the library, and she regularly writes for the library's SL magazine. She has a great passion for libraries and the history of the book and interpretation of Australia from earliest records to the present day. She's quite the package, our Sarah. So today she's going to be talking about Mae Gibbs and uh, Gibbs's long career as a comic strip artist. So Sarah's going to be sharing some examples of Gibbs work which are held by the library uh, and in the collection. So bear with us as she uh, brings up her slideshow um, and talks us through the life and work of Mae Gibbs. I'm going to be back at the end uh, asking Sarah any questions that you may like to ask through the talk. There is a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and if you do have any questions please type them in and I'll be going through as many as I can after Sarah finishes. But for now I'm going to ask Sarah to join me and begin her talk. Sarah are you there? I am. Thank you. There Sarah. you are. Pleasure. I'll leave you to it and Alrighty. I'll see you on the other side. Okay, uh, and thank you everybody for joining me today. Um, tuning in from home, it's a little unusual for us used to doing on-site events, uh, but this is, it's it's a new skill to gain and it's a, it's been quite fun for us all um, as we navigate this whole online environment. So I'd like to begin also by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, the Gadigal people um, that the library is is built on and that the library's collection is housed within. I'd also like to um, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend those respects to any Aboriginal Australians that have tuned in today. Now I'm going to share my slides with you now, so bear with me um, and my head will disappear. Um, I didn't want to distract you. Um, I'll leave you to look at all the pictures as I talk. Okay, so May Gibbs, the comic strip story. Um, comic strips in Australia were influenced by the work coming out of England and America, um, as with most things at that time. Um, America, in America, um, the newspaper, The New York World, was one of the first newspapers to publish comic strips and published the very first full page colour comic. But in Australia, artists had, had been experimenting with the comic form since the, since the mid 19th century. Pictorial humour was appearing in early satirical publications such as the Melbourne Punch, which began in 1855, shortly followed by the Sydney Punch in 1864. Um, then not too long after in 1880, uh, the Weekly Bulletin arrived and that had a lasting effect on Australian sat satiric and comic drawings. So The Lone Hand was established in 1907 and it featured a Norman Lindsay strip-like comic featuring Billy Wattleberry. So there was this genre of joke drawings, caricatures and political cartoons that were incredibly popular and, um, and evolving. Um, it took us a little bit longer to, to introduce the comic strip like in the United States and, and um, England, but, but it was definitely on its way. In his book, Panel by P Panel, John Ryan defines a comic strip as comprising three elements. A narrative told by means of a sequence of pictures or panels, 
a continuing character or char set of characters, and a text or dialogue included within the pictures, often in the form of speech bubbles, but um, but could be as in the, the, the way we may gives in the Euro European style with text under each panel. The Smiths Weekly was founded in March 1919, and it was an illustrated broadsheet with whole pages of joke drawings and political cartoons. And it's in this publication that um, Australia's first comic strip appeared. You can see that on your screen. It was called You and Me uh, by Stan Cross, and it would go on to, to become what we now know as the Pops. During this period, comic strips were introduced as a regular feature in Australian newspapers. So it was the 1920s, a, a real boom for comic strips. One of the most famous Australian comic strip characters was Ginger Meggs, and he was developed by Jim Banks. And um, it was, Ginger Meggs was featured in his strip, Us Fillers, which was later retitled Ginger Meggs. Another well-known character that emerged around this time was Fatty Finn, and Fatty was created by Sid Nichols. Almost four years to the day after the publication of You and Me, celebrated Australian children's author Mae Gibbs became Australia's first female comic strip artist. On the 3rd of August, 1924, her Bib and Bub comic strip arrived on our Sunday breakfast tables. A front page advertisement that had announced Gum Nut Babies in Colour Today. You can see it on the screen nice and clear. So you can read it. Um, perhaps best known for her Gum Nut Creatures Snuggle Pot and Cuddle Pie or Big, Bank, Big Bag Banksia Men, in May's lifetime, she wrote and illustrated 14 children's books. She produced two comic strips and for 10 years, she wrote and illustrated a weekly short story column titled Gum Nut Gossip Extracts from the Daily Bark. But by 1924, Gibbs was a household name. She'd already published five Gum Nut Baby booklets and seven full-length books. So May was born in Surrey, England in 1877 and she immigrated to Australia with her family at the age of four and settled in Perth, Western Australia. Her parents were creative people and very supportive of May's artistic endeavours. Her father Herbert was artistic and, and he, he was very much a mentor for May. He was a talented artist, artist himself and also produced satirical cartoons. May made three trips to England to attend art school and try and establish herself as a, an artist. But while she was in Perth, she gained work as an illustrator for the Western Mail. Throughout 1902, she contributed several satirical cartoons to a Western magazine called The Social Kodak under the pseudonym Blob. And an example is on the left of your screen there. Um, but while she was in London, she contributed satirical cartoons to several publications, the Christian Commonwealth and a suffragette publication called The Common Cause, which is on the right hand side of your screen. In 1913, just before moving to Sydney, May began a series of cartoons for the Western Mail. They, they were quirky cartoons and were um, the for, in the format of a six panel with captions. And it provided a glimpse of the sense of humour that would sustain May's 43 comic, year comic strip career. Um, these are particularly favourites of mine. Um, they're just, there's so much going on and you really get a sense of, of um, her wicked sense of humour. Um, but you can see still, still not a gum nut in sight. Now, um, these assignments with the Western Mail gave May a financial security and the confidence to move to Sydney and pursue a career in children's book illustration. May was 47 years old and had 20 years experience, over 20 years experience in journalistic illustration when she approached Errol Knox, editor of the Sunday News, with her sample comic strips. He initially thought that they were too simple and called in his senior artist, Sid Nichols, with an interview, uh, when he was in an interview with um, May Gibbs. And um, Sid Nichols um, later recalled in an interview with Maureen Walsh, um, May Gibbs' biographer, um, the following. 
Mrs Kelly seemed to be, to me, a bit of an old bird to be entering the comic strip game in her mid forties. I'll just interject. Mrs Kelly was uh, May Gibbs's married name. She married James Osoli Kelly in 1919. So, so he refers to her respectfully as Mrs Kelly. <clears throat> he continued, anyway, I looked at her work. The gum nuts were quite unique. There was nothing like them in the world. They were not fairies, they were not caricatures, but reflected everyone we know. From an artistic standpoint alone, her work had all the essential of fine workmanship, perspective, anatomy, structure, and composition with the simplicity of a talented cartoonist. Why not? She was a graduate of the Blackburn School of Art in London when I was a kid. I wondered if she could keep up the pace for newspaper deadlines, but that was Knox's problem. When I looked up, her twinkling brown eyes returned to my gaze with a puckish grin of confidence that later confirmed my opinion. She could read my mind. My reply to Knox's unasked question was, when does she start? My editor replied, why not now? And so she was hired for the initial sum of five pounds per strip. May Gibbs was to supply a half page cartoon each week with four week strips to be supplied in advance. Her contract was, was for one year with an option to extend and Gibbs kept the syndication rights so she could sell her strip to other newspapers in other states. And she also retained the rights to the strips for her books. It was a male dominated industry and whilst there were talented women working in, in that industry, yeah, supplying um, cartoons to publications Bulletin and Smith's Weekly, um, Gibbs was the first female in Australia to secure a contract to deliver a regular comic strip. In 1943, Kathleen O'Brien produced the comic strip Wanda the War Girl, and in nine, between the 90s and 1940s and 1950s, Moira Bertram produced the comic strip Joe. In the 1950s, Marie Horseman produced the strips Pam and Clothes Horse. In the early days, uh, May was a real um, pioneer for women in the comic strip industry. The image on screen is the open pay, open spread of the first, the, the feature in the first Bib and Bub cartoon. It was um, published on the 3rd, 3rd of August 1924 and it shows the company that Bib and Bub kept. Fatty, uh, Fat and Friends by Sid Nichols, Those Terrible Twins by Cyril Samuels and Marmaduke by Frank Jessup. The strip was syndicated and appeared in the Adelaide Mail for four pounds, four shillings, the New Zealand Herald for four pounds, the Melbourne paper, the Star for three pounds, three shillings. And it, it also appeared in a number of other publications, including the North Queensland Register and the Daily News from her hometown in Perth um, for, for three pounds, three shillings. Bib and Bub were popular. And by the July 1926, Gibbs was in discussions with the Sunday News to deliver her bib and bub strip as a full page in a full page format um, in such a form that it could still be delivered to syndicating newspapers in a half page format. Um, they were to be printed in four colours weekly for the sum of £10. So bib and bub were a, a financial success and provided Gibbs with a steady flow of income. Excuse me. Bib and Bub, uh, Bib and Bub. May Gibbs approached her editor, Errol Knox, with a new idea for a comic strip in 1925. He got rather a shock to see what you're seeing on screen. Um, the main character was Tiki Touchwood, a pipe smoking pig with magical powers. Knox explained that he didn't have room for two strips for young readers and had to decline Gibbs's new cartoon. Well, May wasn't one to be discouraged and approached rival newspaper, The Sunday Sun, who of course were only too happy to accept a May Gibbs comic strip. Um, Errol Knox at the Su at Sunday News was unimpressed and after much discussion finally agreed um, that, that Tiki Touchwood could go ahead in The Sunday Sun on the, on the proviso that um, Tiki Touchwood appear under a pseudonym. So on the 20th of September, 1925, Tiki Touchwood appeared in Sunbeams, the children's supplement of the Sunday Sun under the nom de plume of Sam Cotman. The Sunday Sun was the first newspaper in Australia to introduce a comic supplement and Sunbeams appeared on the 13th 
of November 1921 as a four page three color supplement. So this is a, a picture of um, a notebook that we have in the collection. You can see May is um, fiddling about with um, her, her pseudonym. Um, this one, she, she'd already obviously had a pseudonym that she'd used in the past for the social code cartoons, which was Blob, uh, but she was obviously trying to come up with something that was a bit, a bit more edgy. And you can see Sam Cotman. On the original drawing for the first Tiki Touchwood strip, you can see that May was considering signing it um, Billy Kelly on the bottom left there. Um, but obviously it was Sam Cotman that won out in the day, at the end of the day. So you can see the original drawing on the left with the Billy Kelly that's been, um, you can see just through the whiteout and on the right hand side, the final published um, newspaper with Sam Cotman. So for the first five years of um, the May's comic strip career, May employed agents, the special press, to manage all her comic strip affairs. However, in 1930, around the time that Gibbs became aware that the Sunday Sun had been syndicating her Tiki Touchwood strip in New Zealand without her knowledge, Gibbs terminated their agreement. So she, together with her husband, James Osoli Kelly, took over the management of her accounts, negotiations and distri distribution of her drawings. And um, whilst they saved 25% in agents fees, the increase in workload led them from having to employ an assistant anyway. In February 1930, The Guardian took over the Sunday News and with it the contract for the full page bib and bub. However, unfortunately, by April the same year, they'd reduced it to a half page um, comic strip. In 1931, the Associated Newspapers Limited took over The Guardian and merged it with The Sunday Sun. Unfortunately, the place Bib and Bub held on the front page of the comic section in The Guardian was challenged by Ginger Meggs, who occupied the, first, the full front page of the Sunbeam supplement in The Sunday Sun. The Eric, editor, Eric Vaughan, was not willing to make the change and kept Ginger Meggs as the full page comic and he relegated Bib and Bub back to a half-page strip. The merger also delivered a fee reduction for Gibbs, and she made the bold decision to withdraw both her cartoons from the Sydney press. They did still continue in New Zealand, South Australia and Queensland, though. In, May 19, in 1932, May suggested to her assistant, Nell Palmer, that the Sunday Sun might be interested in her Bib and Bub again. And Nell took up the challenge. She arranged a meeting with the editor, Eric Baum, and took in a sample set of comic strips and explained that the children of other states in, in Australia were enjoying Bib and Bub, but the children of New South Wales were missing out. And in an oral history that was recorded in 1993, Nell recalled that May had lots of arguments with her publishers. And in the oral history, she recounted I saw Mr. Vaughan and I sat down and said, I've come from May Gibbs, to which he replied, have you now, what does May Gibbs want? She told me you don't like it. Well, that's putting it modestly. I bought in some of her work. Yes, I know, I love it. It wouldn't be in the papers if it wasn't for her. She's such a grump. And so after the meeting, Baum agreed to take Bib and Bob back, but provided that he didn't have to deal with May Gibbs personally. Um, and which seemed to be um, a case with um, a lot of her publishers after, after a time, they, um, they preferred to leave their assistants to deal with May personally. Um, so Bib and Bub reappeared in the Sunday Sun on the 25th of June, 1933. May was a fastidious record keeper and she kept track of her business affairs in notebooks at home. This page shows May's record of the first set of Bib and Bub, August 1924. And in her notebooks, she recorded the date delivered, the date of publication, uh, the number of the cartoon, the subject of the drawings, um, and when the drawings were returned. Um, some of other notebooks recorded payment details. 
This page, um, interestingly, um, records the first ticky strip that May signed May Gibbs rather than Sam Cotman. It also reads, um, records the, the date that um, the words were printed. So all of May's um, comic strips featured her scribbly gum writing up to a, up to a time, after which it was replaced with TypeScript to improve legibility. Um, for some of her cartoons were being used um, for kids to learn how to read. So it was suggested that perhaps we should have, have the, the verses typed rather than scribbly gum for, for the, to make it easier for the kids to read. So this is the, um, the Tiki Touchwood cartoon that is the first she, that she signed by May Gibbs. You can see that down the bottom there in the right hand corner. And curiously, this um, Tiki Touchwood so features Bib and Bub. So there was um, definitely a crossover there. The May Gibbs archive is held here at the library and it's a treasure trove of information. It contains her personal and business records, um, lots of original illustrations and manuscript material for her publications and for her comic strips. Um, now, May was incredibly protective of her intellectual property and her copyright, and she insisted that all of her drawings were returned to her after they were published. Um, so, for comic strips alone, there are 32 boxes of original comic strips, as well as eight boxes of comic strip newspaper clippings. Bib and Bub was Australia's longest running comic strip published continuously and draw, drawn by the original creator, drawn by the creator. And it continued for 43 years until 1967, just two years before May Gibbs' death uh, at the age of 92. So one, one comic strip a week for 43 years is 2,236 strips. Plus then the second comic strip that ran for six years to be Touchwood, um, we know that to be Touchwood had, there were 331 comic strips. So that works out roughly to 2,567 comic strips. That's an awful lot of ideas. <clears throat> so May kept a notebook with her at all times and she recorded her ideas in, in her notebooks. Um, she often had a notebook and a pencil in her pocket when she was gardening and would um, stop as and, and record the ideas as they came to her. Um, and many of these notebooks um, are in her archive here at the library. They record ideas for, for her books and her comics. They contain words and sketches and may took inspiration from everyday life, her, her own life. And um, her gum nut babies, Bib and Bub, reflect that. They often found themselves in, in these situations um, she may often took their situations to the next level um, to, to the point of ridiculous, but there was often a, um, a lesson to learn. And I particularly love May's, May's drawings and the, the facial expressions um, with um, a look of shock or horror at what, what was happening. This is one of, um, a page from one of May's notebooks and you can see it's subjects for Bib and Bub. And the, very, the subjects very much reflect May's life. And in particular, the first three items on the list were things May loved to do, camping, picnics, gardening. And the fourth is particularly relevant. It refers to moving, moving to new house, which of course was um, nut, nut coat. So the, it, her ideas very much reflected what, what, was, what she was going through in her life at, at, at any given time. Here's an example of one of the notebooks containing some verse um, and ideas for, for Bib and Bub. There's um, one of the sketches that she did for um, a comic strip where Bib and Bub do the, do the laundry. Now, May um, took a lot of inspiration in her life for ideas for her comic strips. And this is her husband, James or Solly Kelly, or, or J.O. as she affectionately called him. And the inspiration for Mr. Bear, who featured heavily in her Bib and Bob cartoons and, and then went on to, to have uh, his own Mr. and Mrs. Bear. Um, you can see the similarities with the bow tie and 
the, the pipe and the three-piece suit um, right there. Um, May's car, her, her beloved Dodge, um, often featured heavily in her comic strips, as did her Scotty dogs um, as well. So Nutcote. Um, now, for those of you that have, have visited Nutcote, you'll recognise the bathroom in, um, in the strip. You can see the, the water heater in the corner is exactly like the real, um, real thing. The ori orientation of the window and the bath. Um, she was clearly using her home uh, um, as the model. And, um, and the bed for um, Bib and Bub was the sink in, for the kitchen, little kitchen in that coat. And again, you can see the orientation, the window and the, um, the sink exactly like um, like the sink at Nutcote with the, um, the curtains underneath using wooden curtains. So, um, <clears throat> May submitted um, all of her drawings um, with these overlays, the watercolour overlays of tracing paper to indicate colours to the printers. Unfortunately, many of the overlays had been removed from the original boards prior to um, the collection coming to the library in 1970. However, uh, a number of examples are intact. Um, and they're really fabulous because they, they record not only May's creative process, but they're also fine examples of that early stage of comic strip production. So that's what the drawing looks like um, when you raise the, the flap um, that would have, um, the, the strip was produced from. That's what the watercolour overlay looks like. And that's the final product. Um, now that, and this is one of my favourite little cartoons, uh, comic strips with the, the tortoise, um, the house built on the tortoise. So that brings me to May's final uh, comic strip, which appeared in the Sun Herald Junior Supplement on Sunday, 10th of September, 1967 albeit only three panels long, no longer a full page or even half a page, but at least it was, it was still there. Um, and, and right back where she started, um, on the opposite page to Sid Nichols and Fatty Finn. So May was 90 years old when, when she produced this final strip and that's no mean feat to, to be producing, um, operating in, in that, um, that, really stressful environment of delivering a cartoon um, on a, a weekly basis for 43 years. And that's in addition to all of her other endeavours, um, all of her books and her merchandise, the calendars, the cards, the strips. Um, she did produce Bib and Bub in, in books, um, only only three. She, she never branched, made that, that bridge to um, a comic book as such. Um, just republished some of a selection of her strips in several in several um, in several booklet forms in the early days of the comic strips. But I, I think I'll leave that there, Sam. Um, that's it's a nice place to stop. Um, I guess we can um, have questions if there are are any. There are some. Thank you, Sarah. That was fantastic. Hello, welcome back to the screen. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you. Those were beautiful drawings. I love the, seeing the progression of the overlay of those um, those strips. It's so interesting to see behind kind of how things are made. I know. I, know. I, just, I would have loved to show so many more, but it's at least you see and, and you know that there's a selection of them in, in the May Gibbs collection. Yeah, brilliant. So um, the first question is, uh, do you know if May published her comic strips in any other form, for example, in books or almanacs or anything like that? In books. She did. Um, it was through um, Angus and Robertson or the corn, their cornstalk um, imprint. Uh, I think maybe three um, she, she did. And she also then um, used, there was a, um, a publication she did um, as a painting book for kids to colour, like a colouring in book that, that she did with her bib and bub um, strips. Cool. Um, someone said, uh, 
It's a, it's a, it's a big question, Sarah, but I'll ask okay. it. I'll what, take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Under what conditions are the originals stored in the library? Under what conditions are the... Are the originals, the original pieces stored in the library? So I think it's a kind of conservation protection. Conservation, yep, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, they, we have the, the manuscripts uh, kept in our manuscript collection. collection. Um, they're all in archival boxes and um, have been um, rehoused to the best of the library's ability. Um, the volume is enormous, um, so just even the comic strips, strips themselves. Um, but the the original illustrations are divided up um, by into series, um, generally um, in terms of the publication that they were produced for. But the all of the illustrations have been. Um, for her publications, for her books, have been digitised. So you can have a look on our on the library catalogue, and um, and drill down if you're interested. Unfortunately, the the comics haven't. Um, but you know, maybe what maybe one day that that will happen. Um, but in the interim, you can always look on Trove um, for the comic strips. Unfortunately, for some unknown reason. Um, the children's supplements weren't routinely included in, in um, the microfilming in those early days, or even it just seems to be a little haphazard. So some years, some issues, for whatever reason, the, the comic strip sections aren't, just aren't there. But, but it's an interesting process. You can go through Trove or through our e-resources, um, the Sydney Morning Herald, which you, um, the finals, final years where we um, published with this, uh, the Sun Herald. Um, second to last, do we know who has the largest collection of May's work? We do. Yay! Um, <laughs> yay. Uh, we, we are the custodians of, of the largest collection of May's work. Um, there is also a collection of her artwork in this, at the city of South Perth. Um, and that's uh, portraits. It's a combination of her and her father's work, uh, portraits and some, some small landscapes and some of her caricatures that she did on, um, she often drew little caricatures on envelopes when she would send, send to, to family and friends. There's also a, a collection of hers at uh, Stanton Library in their archive there. Um, and that's under the Shand collection, her, her relatives um, presented that there. And um, Stanton also have um, J.O.'s archive as well, James or her husband, James or Solly Kelly's. Um, they're the main um, institutions that have, um, have her collections. Thank you so much, Sarah. The, that's all for the questions for today, except for okay. the one which I'm going to answer because... Oh, okay. It's a question, well, it's first of a statement that people um, are actually listening and watching you from Nutcote as we speak. So that's nice. That's fantastic. Great. Yeah. And they've just asked if we'll be putting this um, talk online. And God willing, we will be uploading this talk to the library's online events page hopefully uh, within the next seven days. So do we keep an eye out? Sarah? I've got one more thing. Um, I meant to, at the end of my talk, just make several acknowledgements. And the first is to Maureen Walsh, who was the May Gibbs first biographer. The second is to Jane Brummett and Robert Holden. They, this, they wrote uh, another book of, um, about May in 2011. They're both fantastic reads, so I recommend you, if you're interested, seek them out. They're, they're really interesting to read about May's life. And the other is to the May Gibbs copyright holders, um, the Cerebral Palsy Alliance and the Northcott um, Society. Um, they, all of May's work is still in copyright and, um, and they inherited, uh, May left all of her copyright to what, what the charities that they were originally um, back in, in um, 1969. So I'd just like to acknowledge all of those people. Nice one. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. So, um, the end of our curated presentation for today. I think that went very smoothly, Sarah. Great job. Thank you. Wait, this is the face. I'm, I'll know I'll regret it, but this is the face that is in all of a lot of May's. Um, when things go wrong, um, this is.
the, 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 the gum nuts and Mr. and Mrs. Bear often go, and that's, what I, was, <laughs> and that's now, what I was experiencing, worried that I would experience here today, but it went smoothly. So, so it's and now that face is going to be on the what's online event page of the State Library's website. No, I'll regret it. Please, but if you want to see it again, anyone, anyone check it out. familiar with May Gibbs's work, her comic strips will be familiar with that jumping startled look on the face. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today and we hopefully will see you again very soon for all of our online events please go to the what's on section of the library's website where you'll find upcoming talks uh, our series all sorts of great things our online exhibitions lots to do still online with your library at home thank you so much for joining us today and we'll see you next time bye